the Ellis Island Simulation for Genealogy Societies. This is another JDW Talks. If you want to know more about me, I have a small pocket website. The address is there. This is recorded June 2020. So why this talk? And this is actually a, uh, a limited audience talk to let genealogy societies know how I've handled in the past an Ellis Island simulation. I'm encouraging others to explore this method of instruction and to provide suggestions on how to design and implement such a simulation. There's a number of ways one can do this. So first, I started doing this as an icebreaker by stamping as members came in inspection cards, which we'll talk about, on their handout for a following talk on finding difficult passengers at Ellis Island. But I like to collect things. So with more and more props, I began to think of a full simulation. Then it was to show how improbable it was for the immigration inspectors at Ellis Island to change names of the passengers by following the paper trail. And then finally, it evolved to show how ordinary people, ordinary people who came to the U.S. became part of the fabric of America and the travails they faced at the immigration station. So my outline for the talk is, we're going to first talk about simulations, Ellis Island simulations, in the classroom and in societies. I'm going to show you three variations of Ellis Island simulations that I've done for societies. I'm going to show you the third time we did it, how we set up a pre-talk mini simulation for all the members coming in, and then the logistic, logistics of a full-fledged simulation. So what is a classroom type simulation? Uh, here's a quote. This is a classroom type. A simulation is basically an attempt to recreate a situation or a phenomenon from the past to put students in a recreated environment as much as possible so they can generate a stronger sense of empathy, particularly for those who suffered as a result of this historical situation or phenomenon. So why do it and for Ellis Island? Well, a lot of schools do it as a unit on immigration. It can be fun if you pick topics that are non-threatening and non-traumatic for students. And I don't know whether the teachers realize that some of the topics they are picking are traumatic. And it can involve students, teachers, parents, etc., in the learning process. There are multiple ways besides straight lecture for learning, analyzing, and feeling a subject and there are multiple learners. And this simulation, once you set it up, can be repeated each year. You can learn from others, and it can evolve over time. Now, there are problems, I think, with classroom simulations, especially for Ellis Island. Schools may not be using current interpretations of the immigrant process and the immigration process, especially the name change myth, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Schools may simplify, not be sensitive to, or in, ignore entirely the issues involving immigration, quotas, discrimination, and the real uh, fact that immigrants struggle to fit into the U.S. culture. There is a book that's used for the lower grades called If Your Name Was Changed at Ellis Island. It's by Ellen Levine. She dedicates it to the memory of her grandfather, Louis Nochamaski, whose name was changed at Ellis Island. And in fact, Ellen's changing his name. He came in as Lee, he didn't come in as Louis. So there's a transliteration problem here. And the story that she gives, handed down from her father, was that when her grandfather came in, the inspector said Jews in the United States are all either Cohen or Levine, and therefore you and therefore he chose Levine. Well, it turns out that that if you actually 
do the research, the story is not correct. And I go into it in detail uh, on this uh, YouTube, what really happened at Ellis Island. This may be put uh, online. It may not be there right now, this YouTube. It will be in the future. And so I tear my hair out when I see an example like this. This is a 2018 simulation that I found on uh, Google search uh, that involved third and eighth grade students. Quote, at some point, some immigrants' names would be randomly changed for nothing more than they were too hard to pronounce. One out of every five students had their name changed because that mirrors what happened at Ellis Island. Complete fiction. Didn't happen. Period. And immigrants didn't lightly change their names. Some of them went to court and had their names changed because they were facing discrimination job discrimination, cultural discrimination. It was not an easy decision to make, and it was done to try and fit into American culture. So just to willy-nilly change names is a discredit uh, and uh, not a real look at what happened. Name changing in the simulation for lower grades should never happen. Here is a 2018 publication by Christine Fermiglish to emphasize that point. Portraying Ellis Island officials as villains who destroyed Jewish identity. And that's what these elementary school simulations are. The Ellis Island officials as villains, they may not realize that, may have been easier than grappling with the fact that Jewish families themselves actively use the government to elide anti-Semitism and battle racism while also establishing themselves as members of the white middle class. Jews were considered a race called Hebrews. Society simulations have things going for them. Members have multiple immigration stories to see how their situation fits into any simulation provides a break from the normal lecture presentation format uh, on societies. And it, of course, it may be a while we're in a pandemic now. Everything is on um, uh, virtual uh, before societies can actually run something like this. Adults can deal better with traumatic topics like deportation and discrimination. It may encourage members, genealogy members, to revisit their immigration documents to see if there's information they missed. And it allows, it can allow society members to highlight their own research and their, own, and their document collection to other members and thus honor their own ancestor immigrants. So my previous society simulations the first major one was for the JGS of Washington State. Elise Morses, Morse and I put together the first major script and how we wanted the logistics done. Members came in in staggered groups entering, quote, Ellis Island. They were faced with a series of tables, each manned by role players, and went through some immigration processes, including uh, stamping documents, being chalked, through saran wrap, etc. This required a large amount of preparation. People straggled in and we went over the allotted time. And the simulation preceded a talk by me on finding passengers, difficult passengers at Ellis Island. The second major one was for the JGS of Greater Boston. Now, when members entered, they had their handout card stamped. On their handout was a card, and they were chalked after answering the question. A group of immigrants then, for the, for the simulation, went before the main audience to a number of manned stations and were processed, and they had wireless mics. I ran concurrently a PowerPoint slide presentation showing the documents that the immigrants were seeing, and they were showing it to the audience, and were being questioned on. Additional background was provided on some stations. 
and then a formal talk on Ellis Island. Uh, probably uh, uh, finding difficult people was then given to the Boston people. The third talk was for the Ventura County Genealogical Society. Members as they came in were directed to a series of tables with exhibits. And then the simulation started with the members who had roles, they sat up front. My intention was to have them move within a limited space to mimic their travels and the different parts of Ellis Island, but the room was too small for such movement and they ended up in place. Scripts were provided and for some with no practice, they did all right, they did all right. It was followed by my talk. I was planning in fall of 2020 to give a full simulation to Santa Barbara Genealogical Society. It was obviously postponed. It would have occupied the entire meeting. And I was going to duplicate the Ventura model. Each time this simulation has been done, it was improved both with script changes and additional original material bought on auction sites. I love to collect things and uh, I keep adding uh, exhibits, demonstrations. So let's look at the smaller experience uh, that we did for Ventura. Society members arriving were directed to six or seven tables in the front with displays, uh, signs, self-explanatory signs, and some role players. There was a need to get members into groups and get them moving through the sequence. This, since this was before the meeting officially started, they were told this would be happening. And the table exhibits were taken down before the actual simulation. Some of them were used during the simulation. Table one, why did people immigrate? Push, pull, factors, so-called. Two table presenters, first one showed differences in immigrants between 1865 from Northern and Western Europe and 1891 from Southern and Eastern Europe. The number one group going through Ellis Island were Italians. And eventually there was a backlash to that group and quotas were established. There are illustrations from Life Magazine issue. There's an issue on 19, in 1990. Um, there's a great graphic for, for uh, why Jews uh, uh, were leaving oppression uh, in uh, the Russian Empire. I give you a uh, link to that. I used Harper's Weekly to show uh, the graphics of immigrants. And I describe some of those and I have a short video, YouTube video, which is up right now, uh, called A Short History of Ellis Island, with some of the graphics. And that's what the uh, first uh, uh, title slide looks like for that, uh, that talk. Table two, buying the ticket. I have original tickets that I found online, uh, bought, and I wanted to show people uh, how much they cost in those years there, and how much it would be in today's dollars. And, uh, it, you know, it, it was expensive. People say it was very cheap. I'm not sure that was true. Table 2 also indicates that many tickets were bought in the, in the U.S. for relatives in Eastern Europe. And I don't think you need to man this table. You could have uh, uh, interpretive signs here. Uh, unless there are some really uh, uh, unique objects. Uh, I must admit, I've never lost a theft any of my exhibits that I generally pass around. And I passed around a lot of them, although I don't see that in my future, even when the pandemic is gone. Here's one example of a uh, uh, steamship ticket I have in my collection. The neat part is on the back where there are all sorts of instructions. And uh, uh, the, the, it's, it's really neat. I don't want to spend too much time in any one of these things uh, because we'd never get through this talk. Table three is for the shipping company. The shipping company provided inspection cards to the immigrants. They were uh, vaccinated, it's on the card, 
And um, uh, at this time also, uh, there was a ship manifest created. And I made my own card and my own stamps. And uh, the consulate, the U.S. consulate, would stamp this in, in the port of departure. And I just decided to get this stamp called shipped, which is easy to find because uh, online, um, and stamp the card. People like to have their cards stamped. These inspection cards, uh, the originals, can be found online at auction sites. Um, it's variable when you see them. Some people think they're very uh, rare and put a high price on them. Some people do not. So it's possible to get one of these original cards. And as I say, I made my own card. Um, I made my own stamp. That stamp on the right I had made. So there are companies that will make stamps like that. And uh, it was, uh, and people really liked being stamped. Table four was uh, devoted to immigration documents. And I had uh, gotten online a lot of documents from a single individual, an Italian, and it deserved its own table. But perhaps a member of the society might want to share their collection of original documents for, their, for the society. Table five is welcome to Ellis Island. Now, some um, some of these sequences uh, I haven't put on these tables. They're reserved for the main simulation. And in fact, uh, the immigrants were first questioned aboard the ship in New York Harbor. Uh, at this table, I provide a stamp for their inspection card. Remember, the first one was shipped. This one will be a stamp for Ellis Island. Another activity was to, and this is a fun activity, was to ask them if they're recent genealogists, you chalk them with an X through saran wrap or a long-term one, an X in a circle. And during the main talk, um, I will say as an aside to the audience, when we talk about chalking, that X is a potential mental defect and X in a circle is a confirmed mental problem because genealogy is, as often mentioned, a disease, an obsession, rather than a hobby. When immigrants went into Ellis Island, they were given landing tags, which had numbers and their name on them. And uh, you can put the, you can use them, uh, reuse them if they're if they're done well. Um, that's that's kind of neat. A lot of the people in the audience. Uh, would like to wear those and then get them returned. You could also have on the table a lot of things, Ellis Island flag, um, pictures of Ellis Island, etc. Table six uh, is an interactive set of tables to show the members uh, how to do some Ellis Island testing. There is a test that we will demonstrate at this table, show them uh, pictures of it, do not demonstrate. The test was for trachoma, uh, at that time a, um, uh, an eye disease which was not curable, which could cause them automatically to be on the deported list. Uh, I have a stereo card and a stereo viewer, and it was done with a button hook. And there's the button hook where they would peel back the eyelid. Uh, pretty painful. Uh, you can see here a stereo uh, card uh, with the process. You can see the tag, the landing tag uh, that uh, people are wearing. Howard Andrew Knox, uh, a MD at Ellis Island, and this is actually a picture of him. There's a book written on him, developed a non-cultural uh, test, IQ test for immigrants. And I, you can make these yourself. The one on the top I bought on eBay person had listed one of these and I haven't seen it listed since and it's a it's a puzzle and not, and not many people failed to put the parts together uh, but this was one of the attempts to do uh, non-cultural IQ testing table seven is a table to indicate to the members that things were not going to be easy going out into American society and I have a stamp that I made from a stamp kit that indicates that although the, although the person was omitted, 
Uh, it warns them they can be deported for being a likely public charge for the next two years, and that is true. And I put space on the handout provided for the stamp. So, and quote marks here on my script, be careful out there. You will be foreigners and aliens for quite some time. You will be picked on and discriminated against. All right, let's turn to the full hour simulation. The logistics are that the society must be large enough to have members assume roles to achieve a semi-realistic simulation. And I had nine immigrant roles and a number of officials, as you will see. Rehearsals might not be necessary uh, as long as all participants have a script. They can read through it. And I do in this an accompanying slideshow showing the activities documents to the audience uh, that occurs as part of the simulation. So it's a hybrid simulation. You could you could alt you could substitute roles uh, from your own members' uh, uh, immigration uh, experiences. Um, that that could be very well done. Now, what I've done is I've accumulated over the years a library of original immigrant documents through this online auction website. And as I say here, nine immigrant roles, including my great grandfather. So here are the nine roles. Um, we have an, a, an individual coming from Ukraine. He's Jewish. He needs to bring his large family after him. He ends up in special inquiry because they think he's a contract laborer. We'll talk about that. He's eventually admitted, and I emphasize, and I research every single one of these people, that he became a citizen. Now, this happened to be my great-grandfather. I have two sisters from the West Indies. They have medical problems. They were hospitalized. They went before special inquiry, and they were deported after appealing. Um, now, the reason I'm including this is because I know they came back again in 1916 and they became citizens. But I have a whole series of letters that I uh, got online at an auction site uh, during, their, during their experience. I have a teenager from Romania, comes in 1922. He doesn't have money to get to his brother. Uh, the records show he had wired for funds and eventually he was released and he became a citizen. I have a married woman from Italy who is second class, which is, you know, she should be released from the ship, but her husband's not there to pick her up. And so she's detained. She's released to him. It's clear from the manifest that she can't, she's illiterate, can't read or write, but she becomes a citizen later in the U.S. We have a male from Yugoslavia. He has lots of visa documents. He went to the consulate and uh, uh, he's admitted. I lost sight of him after he arrived. You should do research on each of these before you buy any documents online. We have a uh, elderly woman from Poland who's coming to her daughter. Uh, she goes to a special inquiry. They want to know whether her, her family in the U.S. can support her, are willing to support her. She sends a telegram to them, which I have, for funds in this affidavit of support, she becomes admitted. We have a, another male from Germany. He has an affidavit of support from his father, who's already in the US. He became a citizen. We have a person from Italy who's only 15, underaged, the one with those tremendous documents. But he's admitted after being detained uh, as his father picks him up. He became a citizen. I have official roles. We have Inspector Leonard, a real inspector. He's an immigration official. The public health official is Dr. Knox, the one who did the, the tests. I have a translator, an Ellis Island Immigration Authority translator. His name is Fiorello. If that rings a bell, that's Fiorello LaGuardia, who spent a number of years as a translator at Ellis Island. And then we have a special inquiry board judge. 
and I can act as the moderator explaining the slideshow and as an Immigrant Aid Society volunteer. So the logistics are you need the participation of the society. It has to be a large society. And here's a little bit about Fior Fiorello, eventually mayor of New York, was a translator for a number of years at Ellis Island, and could speak Yiddish, German, Italian, and Cro Crocian. Probably mispronouncing that. Um, he was born in the United States. And here's Howard, Howard Knox. Now I would suggest, and uh, you, uh, you can stop this video and and see that uh, link there, not really a link, it's an address. But in 1913, 1913, uh, a group did a full stage simulation of uh, the immigrant experience at Ellis Island. It's fascinating. And I used some of the uh, their script, especially some of the questions that were asked uh, for my own simulation. So you should take a look at this. This is available online. Now, the Ventura logistics that I explained, um, I tried not to have too much movement of the immigrant group, and I'll show you a layout I, I had uh, decided on. We weren't able to do that. We need a bunch of handheld microphones, at least two, and a podium microphone as well. One microphone for myself, the moderator, uh, and uh, the slide um, describer. So here's what I had hoped to accomplish, that uh, there are different areas here, um, and the immigrants move through the area. Eventually, they all end up back at the home area, uh, including the two people who were deported, because I tell the audience that they came back and uh, that the next year, 1916, and became eventually uh, citizens. I'll tell you a little bit about my script at the end. Okay, so let's look at the simulation. Station one, they're all sitting there. Uh, I've just uh, uh, introduced them to the audience. And this is part of the script. Welcome to a program of slides and short scenes that commemorate nine immigrants who came through Ellis Island. About 40% of people in the US today are related to Ellis Island passengers. Simulations about Ellis Island are commonly done in schools. There was even a simulation in 1913 that was being done while Ellis Island was in operation, and some of its parts helped with the simulation. Our immigrant roles were real people. This isn't fiction. Most had their documents appear on an online auction site. Italians and Jews were the two major groups coming through the New York Harbor Station, which accounted for about 70% of all U.S. immigrants during that time. Seven of, of our immigrants came before 1924 and two from the late 1920s. The heyday of Ellis Island was 1892 through 1924. Since the immigrants came on different ships, different times, and under different regulations, as script author, I took a few liberties to keep these immigrants together and to cover some undescribed portions of the process. But most of what you will hear and see is based on actual documents, including census schedules of their U.S. relatives and known immigration procedures. So let's give a hand to your immigrants and officials. And I have an easel, and I'm going to show you easel signs. I'm not going to do any more than just flash them on the screen. So I, the moderator, introduced the role players to the audience and the constraints as you just heard. The immigrants introduced themselves, where from and what year, first names. And some of the immigrants are asked why they made the decision to leave. Economics, husband in the U.S., oppression in the native land. And as a moderator to the immigrants, I suggest you write a goodbye letter to your relatives and friends. If you can't read or write, then dictate one, since so some of them are illiterate, since you may never see these people again. 
I mean, this is a major decision. And uh, uh, my PowerPoint slide is discussing the immigrants to Ellis Island, uh, Italians being the number one group. Let's go to the consulate. Now, the members originally don't have to move from where they are. Um, my idea is that, first of all, that not all the immigrants are going to need this. Starting in 1920, they would need a visa and, and go under the quotas. Um, there are passports online with lots of stamps. You want a stamp from the consulate. And I even had one uh, with a medical release note. Uh, it indicates that consulates were taking over the duties of Ellis Island. You don't need a consulate office. All you need is one immigrant with a visa experience to describe what happened to them at the consulate. They can go up to the podium and describe it. And there's lots of information I could do as a moderator. The affidavit of support, quotas, and consulate's responsibilities. Next station, ticket agent. I have a little railroad hat there because they were selling railroad tickets as well as steamship tickets. I have that flag. So I'm going to show activities here. We certainly don't want to duplicate what's on that pre-demonstration table. Uh, we can tell the immigrants, uh, you know, if you buy a ticket, you're going to be deported if you meet these classifications. You're going to take an oath an oath from a declaration. And the Manifest Destiny shows you this pre-shipping um, declaration that the shipping company asks you to fill in. I mean, if you put on that thing, uh, gee, I'm a polygamist and I believe in anarchy, you're not going to be given a ticket to come to the U.S. And in addition to that, uh, if you came to the U.S. and were deported, the shipping company had to pay for your way back and were fined. So there was a, a, some forms that immigrants filled out so that they will put the information was put on the manifest. You didn't just go up to a ticket uh, uh, booth in Hamburg and say, I want the next uh, ship out. Uh, here's my money and walk, walk aboard the ship. It wasn't that simple. And I have information on that process in this manifest that's in the YouTube which, as I say, may not yet be um, on uh, YouTube, but it will be. Okay, let's go and leave for the uh, U.S., and we're going to have to interact with a shipping company. So here I have, with a cheap captain's hat, a bunch of landing tags that the JGS of Washington put together for me. I really appreciate that, and something that looks like what's called an index book. And you can get a replica captain's whistle online. Um, uh, I think it's a white star uh, captain's whistle that will wake up the audience. And you would discuss the inspection cards and the landing cards, etc. Uh, another possibility is for the immigrants to get up and and walk around, maybe go on a plywood plank to, to mimic the gangplank, uh, roll around with waves, then they can go back to the original chairs. So we haven't used the rest of the, of the chairs and the logistics. Now, you come into New York Harbor. You're still in the original chairs. And Inspector Leonard and Translator Fiorello go aboard and question some passengers. Uh, first and second class passengers are released from the ship, unless there's a problem, and they uh, can remain in their original seating. If after 1924, uh, the rest are released to shore, if there's no problem, they can remain. But the rest will have to go through Ellis Island Station, and they can proceed then to the next seating area for medical testing. Here is an immigration inspector, translator Fiorello. Uh, I found some reproduction badges. Uh, the hat is from Masonic 
society. They're often on uh, eBay. Uh, you can buy them for twenty, thirty, forty dollars, and and uh, uh, you know modify them. I'm wearing a uh, immigration service trench coat, and here is Inspector Leonard uh, with a Masonic uh, hat on, modified uh, reproduction uh, badge and some other jewelry in that sense, uh, with an immigration service jacket, although. That's probably from the 30s or 40s, certainly not from the heyday of Ellis Island. So we're arriving at Ellis Island. We're going to go through a medical exam. They're going to have, we start wearing their landing tags. The public health medical staff had their own military style uniforms. Um, I'm going to just use a simple lab coat here. Uh, the uh, the public health person stamps the inspection card. And I will explain that if the immigrant looks too closely at that card, the inspector chalks them with an E because he detects uh, bad eyesight. Everything they did was uh, for a reason. And the, ch and the public health official uh, chalks the uh, immigrants, and that's when I tell the audience what their own chalking was like. Here is a very famous picture of a uh, blended family. They have name the, the landing tags on them. It was often only given to the head of the family, but every person has it. And so this brings up an important point, and I emphasize this during the, uh, the PowerPoint show, that if I say to them, what's your name? Why are you doing that? The name is on the landing tag. It's on the manifest. It's on the inspection card. And it's been suggested that that uh, what's your name was to check hearing and speech. You know, a lot of the name change uh, stories are the inspector says, what's your name? Doesn't understand the answer uh, and somehow writes down uh, Berlin because he missed because the immigrants said I'm from Berlin. Uh, well, the, nothing was written down except for detention and special inquiry. Um, doesn't make any sense. And the, and the say the current um, consensus is that name changing did not happen at Ellis Island. And here is Dr. Knox on all his glory. Um, his uh, uh, in his emblem or whatever that's called on the hat is of the public health service. He has a stethoscope on. He has some pins from the public health service and a medal from the public health service. And he says, I'm part of the public health service present here at Ellis Island. I'm not an immigration inspector. I'm Dr. Knox to the audience and to the immigrants. Well, actually, um, if that's the case, it's going to be to the audience. We don't have final say over whether immigrants are accepted or rejected, but do provide input to the immigration officials. Our concern is the health of the immigrant. You might not have heard of me, but recently a book was written about me and my work at Ellis Island producing non-cultural tests for determining the mental ages of immigrants. Here is a chart of the chalking uh, symbols. Some of, them, of the immigrants, my roles, are going to have uh, more than, uh, you know, it could be a P for an elderly person. Uh, it could be some other uh, image, uh, other chalkings as well. And here's the stamp uh, on their inspection card. And the, uh, the Dr. Knox might ask, um, how do you wash stairs from the top down or the bottom up? Count backwards from 20. Now, two sisters in my simulation went to the hospital so they should start coughing because they're going to be sent there from here. And the rest are going to move to the Great Hall. So we have eliminated people who were uh, uh, came after 1924. They're still sitting in their home area. We've eliminated two people who go to the hospital area. Um, we eliminate uh, our second uh, class uh, ticket person 
who has been detained probably on the ship, um, et cetera. And so of the nine, we don't have uh, maybe five, if I remember right, going to the seating of the Great Hall. So the main concern of inspectors here, they're not going to read all the questions on the manifest, are do immigrants know where they're going? Do they have a place to go? And do they have sufficient funds to get there? And will they be able to support themselves in the United States or become likely public charges? And do they have a promise of jobs in the U.S. before they landed, which is illegal? The uh, uh, it's called a contract laborer. And the deportation rankings are such that LPC is the number one reason for be deported, and a contract laborer was the second most uh, often reason. Let's introduce the translator. I'm Fiorello, a translator here in 1907 to 1910 and can help with Yiddish, German, Italian, and Croatian. I'm a son of immigrants and have Italian and Jewish heritage. Let me give the immigrants here a warning. Be prepared to walk a tightrope here. Two main reasons for deportation at Ellis Island is being a likely public charge or a contract laborer. A laborer cannot come to the U.S. with a job in hand because labor unions made that illegal. Gee, didn't I just say that? Some classes of skilled labor or professionals and entertainers are excluded from this law. So it's tricky for immigrants to show they didn't come here with a specific job offer, but that they could earn a living here. Now, some of the immigrants are going to be sent to detention, not to special inquiry, talk about that, because of a lack of funds or no one is there to pick them up, and those problems will be resolved. Some are going to be sent to the Board of Special Inquiry, and that's about 6% uh, of immigrants, and a third of them are going to be deported. And these are trap questions. Who paid for your ticket? Oh, uh, a U.S. Steel. No, you're going to be deported. Do you have friends and relatives here? No, I came here by myself. No, you're going to be a likely public charge. Deported. Do you have specific jobs plans here? Well, I don't have anything in mind. I don't really have many skills. I understand your streets are paved with gold. Deported. Likely public charge. In 1885, it was illegal for American employers to import aliens or to assist in their importation or migration into the United States under any contract made prior to the importation or migration for the performance of labor or service of any kind. Now, the Board of Special Inquiry must have been a tension-filled uh, hearing. Two of my immigrant roles are going to be deported. One of the sisters returns to go to this board. Um, the others that I sent, the roles that I sent there are eventually omitted. And for each immigrant omitted, I inform them whether they became a citizen or not. And the omitted immigrants can go back to their initial seating. The two people who are deported go to a new area. You see, it's a very formal thing. There's a translator here. I think there's a group of three people. Uh, who are commissioners. There are a lot of grounds for exclusion. Um, Jewish Gen has a whole file on markings, and you might uh, look at that, ma manifest markings. Different uh, areas, but uh, we're, we go to the two sisters, everybody else by now, is back in the home area. And I have 1915 letters from the sisters that the role players read portions of. Uh, it's really a heart-wrenching situation. 
and it seems as a matter of policy they were kept in the dark about their appeal. They did appeal, and one day were told they would be deported the very next day. They had relatives in the U.S. that didn't even get to see them. Uh, they did come back to the U.S., were admitted, and eventually became citizens. And uh, show them this. It's kind of ironic. Uh, no, this letter paper is furnished by the government free of charge to immigrants detained at Ellis Island, New York Harbor, for use in communicating with their relatives or friends. And it looks like the, uh, um, they, they were censored, the letters. In fact, the two sisters couldn't write to each other. One was in the hospital, one was in detention, without uh, uh, feeling that they were being snooped on. And then again, I have a final warning. I have some graphics on that. Um, immigrants, especially the new wave of them during Ellis Island's heyday from Southern and Eastern Europe were often met with a discrimination, prejudice, and less opportunities to fit into the cultural and economic life of their new country. Our main reason, obviously, for changing one's name. And this part of my simulation reinforces that. Now, finally, if you're serious about undertaking this, I have a 42-page script, which is constantly being revised, that I'm willing to share on an individual basis for your society's program planning. So if you're just curious about this, I'm not willing to just spread it around. I consider that script copyright. So, but I will willing to share it. So contact me, Joel Weintraub, at census1950 at cox.net. So this has been the Ellis Island Simulation for Societies. It should have a limited uh, appeal on YouTube. I don't expect too many people to actually visit it. This has been a JDW PowerPoint talk. Right now on YouTube, I have six census talks including two on the 1950 census, which will become public in April of 2022. I will have three, once I submit this one and another one, today or tomorrow, three Ellis Island talks and two scheduled ones for August 2, 2020. And those, will, those talks will be on how to find difficult people on the manifest and the name change myth. And I now have six natural history talks on YouTube, including two on optics. So if you want to uh, be in the loop for the two uh, future Ellis Island talks, you can subscribe to this channel. Um, if you're happy with the, the uh, material I'm presenting, please uh, you know, spread the word. Thank you for your attention.